we're on to our next theme. In addition to international work, Mark has managed several community fieldwork projects in Cumbria, including the four-year Discovering Derventia. The Roman project at Pap Castle and has, recorded, uh, and has coordinated numerous walkover surveys, geophysical surveys, and excavations related to the monastic landscape of home country at uh, Abbeytown. So, uh, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, when I was asked to give a talk on archaeology on the Solway, that's, uh, that's quite a big subject. And I thought about going through the greatest hits, you know, showing you the, the, the best sites. But instead, I wanted to just show you some very recent work that we've been doing to show you, you know, how it works in the field, share some highs and lows of, of geophysics, prospection, and community archaeology. And I'm going to do that through a tale of two halls. So the first site we're looking at um, is Rogerscuff. It's a, a natural drumlin. Have I got a pointer on that? Oh, yeah. Here you go. That's, that's the Roger Scuff Drumlin. It sits out, out on the Solway. It's a natural glacial feature, um, a mound sitting surrounded by bog, and effectively forms a natural island. Um, there was no known archaeology here. Nothing of, of great significance uh, has been recorded, but the, the Drumlin is bought now by the RSPB. There's a lot of peatland restoration going on around there, and as part of that process, we were asked to come in and look for any significant archaeological remains, which, of course, we were delighted to do because that's the kind of joined-up, multidisciplinary approach that landscape research deserves. Uh, you can see it there in the LIDAR data. Uh, it really is a, a quite a dramatic feature. When, when you go out to Roger Scuff, uh, you stand on the top, the views of the Solway all around... Uh, it's an unusual place. It's sometimes quite an ethereal place. Um, and why wouldn't there be archaeology there? You know, it, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's a stepping stone in the bog. We have the Roman archaeology, the defences all around the coast there. So we had high hopes, and it, it's, it was definitely worth a look. And so we did that through geophysical prospection. Uh, we put out a call to volunteers, and at least four people now I've seen in this room who have done this work, and catch them at lunchtime, they'll tell you how cold they were. Um, th this process you see here is, is resistivity, so we use two techniques. We measure the electrical resistance to current in the ground, which can show us archaeological features, and we use magnetometry. Uh, we do that very systematically, covering the, the ground grid by grid, and we build up a resistance plan and a magnetic plan. Uh, so we did this in, in two phases. The first phase, um, November 22, we went out for three weeks, which was quite long enough in one phase. Uh, I'm going to show you the results. This is magnetometry, and to be honest, it's pretty much clean as a whistle. Uh, but we know that it's working, sorry, uh, because this feature here, for example... Oh, sorry, I've skipped a few... Um, that shows you some, some material in the ground around a, a farm gate. Uh, but the resistance survey was a little more interesting. This is the resistance plot. And you can see here, you have what are called ice wedge polygons, which for any geologists in the room, that's a natural feature. And uh, you can also see this curving line here. And we weren't sure if that was natural or archaeological. We were thinking that maybe... Uh, through the cultivation of the drumlin, material was pushed to the edge. Could it have been a bank? Did it go all the way around the edge um, of the drumlin? So we ended our first season with some questions. Was this going to form a big enclosure all the way around, um, or would it end? So that was good. We went out again in February. Uh, the weather was nice and cold. The magnetometry here, you can see we've added some, an area here. And you see the black and white striped lines. Again, that just tells us the instruments are working well because those are services to the old farm. The resistance survey, as you can see, our possible enclosure did not carry on, so that was a bit of a shame. However, this area here started to look a bit interesting. If I zoom in, now, 
archaeological geophysics, part of the art of that is discerning between geological anomalies and archaeological anomalies. So what is man-made, what is ground disturbance, as opposed to natural geological variation. And on glacial archaeology, that can be very difficult. But behold, the Hall of the Iron King. <laughs> you might have to squint a bit at this one, but bear with me. So what we have here is, is ground disturbance, and it forms a pattern. You see the sort of rectangle there? And that's defined by high-resistance anomalies in a parallel arrangement, and it makes this rectangle. If you're not convinced yet, the magnetometry did find something in this field. This line here is not natural, and when we looked at the molehills, we found evidence of iron working. So we have industrial metal working, we have a rectilinear arrangement of, of high resistance anomalies, which may be post pads, and the last thing that got us excited was this feature here in the resistance sits right in the middle. So could that be a hearth? Were we looking at the hall? An early medieval big hall, I could smell the smoke from the chimneys, I could hear the feasting in the hall. So we had to have a dig, and we did. I contacted my colleagues. I share this information, by the way, with colleagues, just to make sure I've not gone mad on the drumlin and start seeing things. Uh, but we decided it was worth a dig, and we put a trench in, or well, a test pit here, to look at one of these post pads. And the hall of the Iron King came crashing down around my ears. <laughs> Our industrial waste was actually 20th century blast furnace slag. It was too glassy and white, so it was brought in. The post pads, it's quite interesting, um, they were land drains, one, <laughs> one metre deep. Now, where the land drain cuts through a band of clay, the material from that band of clay goes back into the top of the land drain cut. So every time the drain meets the clay, you get a high-resistance anomaly in the top of the drain. And our hearth was just some slightly magnetic stones. <laughs> I'm sharing, you know, that's, that's life. But as an archaeologist, you have to answer the puzzle. That's how it goes. So what we could say is that the instruments worked. We found some evidence of land drains. We found the plowing. Um, but in fact, we found no significant archaeological remains yet. OK, that was hole one. <laughs> Having said that, we are going back because the eastern part of the drumlin we've not looked at yet. So, you know, the good archaeology, we have a saying in archaeology, if it's not under the spoil heap, it's definitely in the next field. Uh, so, hope springs eternal. It's a great place to work. We, ha we have a good crack on site. We've also got our own site owl. So, look out for next winter, we think we'll go and finish the survey to the east. Try this hall, then. Our second project, this is all happened this year, happens at Tarns. Now, Tarns is not on the coast, but it's just on the end of the edge of the Solway Coast, AONB here. Um, I was a bored archaeologist last year, being forced to fill in a spreadsheet, sitting in the office. But I do have unfinished business at Tarns, because having worked at Home Culturum, we know that the Monastery of Home Culturum established a grange farm at Tarns in the 12th century. So the monastery established 1150. By the end of the 12th century, they had a Grange farm here. The Grange de Ternis, it's in the documents. But we don't know exactly where. We also know the monastery had a chapel there, the Chapel of St. Roche, the location of which is still a little bit ambiguous. And it's an unusual place. This is a natural, natural body of water. So I put my spreadsheet to one side, and I decided to have a look at some open source aerial data, you know, get on Google Earth, forget the spreadsheet for now. And I spotted this um, actually in Google Maps, one of their aerial images, and I thought, well, that's crop marking nicely. Now, we know there are crop marks around here because in the 70s, um, Barry Jones, for example, flew a lot of flights, and we know there are ditches, but I hadn't seen anything in this particular field. So I had to zoom in, and I nearly fell off my chair, because I saw that. 
Now that is a remarkable thing to see from, a, from an aerial photograph because it is clearly the footprint of a timber building. What we're looking at here, the larger post holes in the middle, these are the load-bearing timbers, and around the outside you have small posts for wattle and daub or however it was built. But very rare to see this in an aerial photograph. So, spreadsheet totally forgotten now. I thought, right, well, let's see what this can tell us. So I had, went on Google Earth. Um, so as you can see, it doesn't show quite as clearly, but it is still there. So this is a feature in the ground, totally unrecorded, the footprint of a timber building. The crop mark is showing positive post holes, which suggests they are holes rather than pads. Um, it's a post in earth construction, so people aren't you know, building a stone foundation and putting the, the posts on. They're actually putting the posts in the ground. It's 50 metres long, so it's big. Uh, 15 metres wide, and it, it forms an aisle building which has 10 bays. Uh, so... In May this year, the West Cumbria Archaeological Society came and they wanted to do a bit of field work over a weekend. And I said, well, I've got this, seen this site on, on an aerial photograph. Uh, they made contact with the landowners, who are absolutely delightful and really excited. And so we went and we did a day of geophysics, just magnetometry. As it happens, at the end of May, it was extremely hot and dry, and I couldn't even get the resistance meter in the ground. So <laughs> unusual in Cumbria. But what did the magnetometry show? Well, that's the field where the building is, and it's not there. I'll show you in a minute where it sits. But what we did find is down here, evidence of metal working. Is this sounding familiar? <laughs> <laughs> that's where the building sits in the geophysics. It, it's not a magnetic anomaly, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We can see it in the crop mark. There are post holes there with differential moisture that is causing the crop to grow differently. And now we have a 50 metre timber building with associated metalworking. We can see that the building is truncated. It's cut through by a later ditch. We don't know the dates of any of these features yet. But we would like to have a look. So what could it be? Well, remember the reason I was looking at this field in the first place was because there is a monastic grange farm there. The arrangement of post holes suggests a structure like this with load-bearing timbers um, forming these aisles. So, but it doesn't look like a monastic Cistercian barn. Cistercians build, um, actually, obviously, later in stone. They build very angular buildings, really nice. Our, our post hole setting looks a bit curvilinear for that. So could it be... One of these. This is what we'd like it to be. <laughs> I actually worked on the reconstruction of this building in Denmark in 20-odd well, years ago as a recent graduate. Uh, Cumbria is lacking buildings like this, but they, they must be here. Hmm? So that's, that's the question. We, we have to find out. I, we will dig the holes. Um, we've put in, but first of all, we want to do a bit more work. So we want to get resistance survey on this field, see if the post holes and other features show with resistance. We're going to, do, we hope to do, and I, I should add, we've put in a funding, a funding application for farming in protected landscapes to do this work, which we'll find out next week if we've got it. So if we do, we will do an extended survey. We need to see the extent of this industrial activity here. If it is metal working, there has to be water, and this here looks like it could have been a body of water, and speaking to the farmer, it was. Uh, there are other crop marks. So we get the bigger picture with the geophysics. We try the resistance. We want to complete that by March 2024, and then following that, 2024-25, we would like to do some community excavation and answer the questions, get the dates. So there are lots of opportunities to be involved. Um, all of the work I've shown you has been carried out by volunteers in the field, and I'm incredibly grateful that people come out and help us answer these questions and find these sites and understand them. I'm sorry that both of the sites I've shown are on the south side of the Solway, but we have developed a heritage lottery application um, where we want to do a cross-border inner inner Solway coastal community archaeology projects where we use techniques like this 
both sides of the Solway investigating sites. Um, some of those could be intertidal, some just associated with the Solway. So that'll be really exciting. Keep your eye open for that. And if I'm back next year telling you a tale of three halls, this one didn't work out. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Th thank you so much. You, you built me up, you know, I could smell the feast and then you knocked me down, but perseverance does, does pay off and what a fantastic call for your help or spread the message. What, a, what an opportunity to volunteer. One quick question.